Shalom Israel, it's Kazawan, and the name of this video is The Name of God in the Ancient Hebrew. I'm doing this video because people ask me all the time, what is the Most High's real name? And why do I speak the dialect of Hebrew that I speak? So in this video, I'm going to deal with those questions and hopefully clear some things up. Now before I get to the scriptures, and before I deal with the name of the Most High, First, we have to get some understanding about the Hebrew language. Now on the screen, the top section is the ancient Hebrew script, and on the bottom is the modern script that's used today. Myself and many others are able to read the ancient script, but unfortunately, you can't really find any Bibles with the ancient script in it. So for this video, I'm going to use the modern script because more people are familiar with it. Now, the first thing you must understand is that the sound of modern Hebrew today is not the same as the sound of ancient Hebrew. The Hebrew that Moses spoke did not sound like the modern Hebrew that is spoken today. I'm using Moses as an example because he wrote the first five books of the Bible. The sound of Hebrew words that we hear today only exists because of Masoretic vowel points, and a prior system of vowels called Matris Lectionis. Here's the thing. Neither one of these vowel systems existed during the time of Moses. Now I'm going to do my best to make this video as short as possible, but there's a lot of information to cover in order to explain this issue clearly and thoroughly. So bear with me as I go through all the information. Now let's deal with the Masoretic vowel points first. This is Genesis 1 and 1, and this is how it sounds in modern Hebrew. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashemayim wa et ha'aret. Now the reason it sounds that way is because of these dots, dashes, and vowel points surrounding the words. These symbols are known as the nikud. The Nikud is a system of dots, dashes, and vowel points that tell the reader how to pronounce the words. Now, if I was to take these dots, dashes, and vowel points away using modern Hebrew, how would this verse sound? Let's see. It says, Notice that I didn't say anything. You know why? Because without the Nikud, without the dots, dashes, and vowel points, these words cannot be pronounced. The dots, dashes, and vowel points tell the reader how to pronounce the words. So without them, all you have left is silence. Now here's the problem with that. We know that these vowel points did not exist during the time of Moses. So how did he say Genesis 1 and 1? Well, those of us who speak the ancient Hebrew we say it like this, bara ashaf bara ah, alahayim ath hashamayim wa ath ha aratiza. Now I know some of y'all are saying that's not real Hebrew, that's that made up Hebrew. Okay, we're going to see if it's made up a little later. But right now, let's continue to deal with this modern Hebrew. Thankfully, I can read the ancient and the modern. So let's see how the modern Hebrew works first. Now, as I said, the Nikud, which is the dots, dashes, and the vowel points, these do not exist in the original Hebrew manuscripts, and that's a fact. Anybody can Google that information and verify that. However, for the sake of the video, I'll give a quick reference. This is a small article called, The Vowel Points in Hebrew Were Added. The website is listed in the top right-hand corner. But again, this is a known fact. Now, right here it says, Masoretic vowel points, Hebrew, or as the system is now called, Masora from Mesore, tradition, and Masar to hand down. It says, The rabbis who busied themselves with the Masora were called Masorites. The Masora is a list of rules that the Jewish Masorites made on how to pronounce Hebrew words. 
It says, they, the Masoretes, were also the inventors of the Masoretic points, which are supposed to give the vowelless words of the scriptures their true pronunciation. So you see that the original text was vowelless, meaning there was no written vowels. But the Jewish Masoretes put these points in the text that are supposed to tell you how to pronounce the words. Right here it says, This was the invention of the rabbis of the school of Tiberius. Watch this. In the 9th century CE AD. In other words, this was the invention of men. These vowel points are not found anywhere in the original manuscripts. And these vowel points were not fully established until around the 9th century AD. Now let me put that in perspective. The Messiah lived during the 1st century AD. It wasn't until 800 years later, after the time of the Messiah, that the vowel points were established. Watch. Let's go down to the end. It says, The ancient Hebrew and the Hebrew spoken by the Messiah did not have vowel points. They were added to the Hebrew text. See this guy right here? This is exactly what the Masoretes did. They took the vowelless Hebrew text and added different sounds to the words. Let me give you an example. On the screen, you see two Hebrew letters or consonants. This first letter in modern Hebrew is called a he, and it's equivalent to an H, like hat or hot. This second letter is called a wa, and it's equivalent to an English W, like wax or water. Now, if I try to read this word without any vowel points, it doesn't say anything. But if I add a vowel point on top of the wa, it changes it from a wa to the o sound. Now it sounds like this, ho. If I move this point down to here, it changes the wa to the u sound. Now it sounds like this, who. Now this one is very important to this study. Whenever you see the letter wa with a dot in this position next to it, it's called a sharuk, sharuk. This is how you produce the u sound in modern Hebrew. We'll come back to that later. Now if I take this point and move it down under the wa, it changes the wa to the e sound. Now it sounds like this, he. This is not the actual word he, but the vowel point in this position produces the sound he. Now I'm not going to go through every symbol, but that gives you the basic idea of how the Nikud or the vowel point system works. By just moving the position of the vowel point, we went from ho to who to he using the same word. Many people depend on this Masoretic vowel pointing system for the correct Hebrew pronunciation. But this system is false and corrupt. This is a book called Proofs of the Interpolation of the Vowel Letters in the Text of the Hebrew Bible by Charles William Wall. This is page 8, and he's addressing the topic of using the vowel points for the correct pronunciation. It says, But it would be going much too far in praise of the Masoretic system of vowels to assert that it has completely preserved the ancient pronunciation of Hebrew, or kept it exactly the same as it was from the very outset. Meaning, it would not be wise to believe that the Masoretes preserved the proper pronunciation of the Hebrew. It says, On the contrary, external evidence which is accessible to us on the subject serves to show that, in the course of a vast number of successive ages, some changes have taken place in this respect. In other words, there's plenty of evidence 
that shows that the Masoretes changed the sound of the original Hebrew by using their vowel points. So we see that the vowel pointing system is not dependable for the correct pronunciation of ancient Hebrew words. So we can leave that system alone. Now, some brothers who are more learned on this subject, they know that there was a vowel system in use before the dots and dashes of the Masoretes. That vowel system is called the Matres Lectionis. So let's deal with that. The Matres Lectionis is a vowel system where certain Hebrew letters are used as vowels. This system was in place before the vowel points were invented, but it wasn't in place during the time of Moses. He didn't use that system. If it was possible to travel back to the time of Moses and you showed him the Matrix Lectionis, look at his face. <laughs> That's just a joke. But the point that I'm making is Moses never heard of the Matrix Lectionis. It didn't exist. When Moses wrote the scriptures, there were no vowel letters. Now, let me show you an example of how the Matrix Lectionis works. This is 1 Samuel 18, verse 9. It says, And saw I David from that day and forward. Now let's look at this verse in Hebrew without any vowel points because we're dealing with the Matrix Lectionis vowel letter system. This is the word David. Remember, the Hebrew is read right to left. Now, this first letter is equivalent to the letter D. This second letter here, if you remember, is the Y. So it would be a W. And this third letter, again, would be another D. So altogether, we have D, W, D. Let's get rid of the rest of this verse and just focus on the name David. Now, watch this. This is 1 Chronicles 3 and 9. It says, These were all the sons of David. That's all we need for this point. Let's look at this verse in Hebrew without the vowel points. Now here we have the name David again, but notice it looks different. There's an extra letter added to his name. So let's isolate the name David in this verse. So now we have two forms of the name David. Let's put them side by side. Now in 1 Samuel 18 and 9, the name David is DWD. But here in 1 Chronicles 3 and 9, the name David is DW, and then we have a new letter added. In modern Hebrew, this letter is called a Yod, and it's equivalent to a Y, like yes or yarn. So now we have D, W, Y, and at the end, another D. So why is David's name spelled two different ways? Because this is an example of how Matrix Lectionis works. Using this system, the Aleph, the He, the Y, and the Yod can be used as vowels. The Y that we see here in the name David is not used as a consonant letter. This Y is a vowel letter that produces the E sound. This vowel letter tells the reader to pronounce the Y with an E sound after it. So instead of saying Y, you would say we. The vowel sound E is combined with the previous letter Y, giving you the sound we. This is why you hear some people pronounce David's name as Dawid. That's how Matrix Lectionis works. Certain letters are used as vowels to produce certain sounds. That's why if you look at the name David from 1 Samuel 18 and 9 with the vowel points added, you will notice that the Yod or the Y is missing. But the Masoretes placed a vowel point under the Y letter. Why? Because if you remember from earlier, when the Y has a point under it, it produces the E sound. 
So you would read this name as Dawid. So what that shows us is that the vowel pointing system of the Masoretes was based on the Matrix Lectionis vowel letter system. So the question becomes, is the Matrix Lectionis the ancient system of writing that Moses used? If it is, then the modern Hebrew pronunciation is correct. But if it's not, then a lot of the sounds that are used in Hebrew today are wrong. Watch this. Let's go back to this book. It's called Proofs of the Interpolation of the Vowel Letters in the Text of the Hebrew Bible by Charles William Wall. This is page five of the introduction section. It says, The Hebrew Bible, as it issued from the pens of its inspired authors, was written without vowel signs of any kind, whether points or or letters, meaning the original biblical manuscripts did not contain any vowel points or any vowel letters. Watch this. Let's go to page 19 in chapter 1. It says, I may hereby anticipation add, and will be found equally to apply to the matrix lectionis after it shall have been proved that those letters do not any more than the points constitute part of the Hebrew scriptures as originally written. So once again, the Matrix Lectionis vowel letter system is not found in the original manuscripts. Moses did not write those extra letters in the text. Those extra letters came to be a long time after Moses. See, what you have to understand is, like every other language, the Hebrew language has gone through different changes over time. Not to mention our different captivities, which caused us to pick up different sounds in different types of words. But we're talking about the original sound of the Hebrew. The vowel letter system was introduced to Israelites by outsiders. We didn't make up that system. Other nations was using different types of words and we were exposed to that. Some of us may have picked up some of those words as early as the 8th century through Aramaic influence. That's documented. But as a nation, we were trying to maintain our original language because for us, it wasn't just a language. It was a holy language. Now, when the Greeks came into power, everything changed because they forced the vowel letter system on us in our captivity. Look at this. This is page eight from the same book in the introduction section. It says, in the first place, then about two centuries after the termination of the Babylonian captivity, and while a considerable number of persons still continue to speak pure Hebrew as their vernacular dialect, watch this, it says, Asia was invaded by a people who had introduced into the original alphabet the vast improvement of vowel letters. Meaning, a group of people invaded Asia and they brought the vowel letter system with them and changed the original alphabet. Let's see what happened. It says, and the Jews were in consequence forced in spite of their prejudices, to learn a species of writing that made them acquainted with the use of such letters. Meaning, the Israelites were forced against their will to take on this new writing system. It wasn't by choice. Watch this. It says, In the second place, their scriptures were very soon afterward translated into the tongue connected with this writing by the order, as tradition tells us, of a pagan government, and at any rate, in a country in which they and their religion were peculiarly hated and despised. This is talking about the Greeks. It was the Greeks who forced us to adopt the vowel letter system. Look at this. This is the bottom of page 14 in the introduction section. 
It says, For although some other Asiatic nations making use of syllabaries may have been induced by observation of Grecian practice voluntarily to change them into alphabets of a superior order through the introduction of the irregular species of vowel letters technically called matris lectionis. Let me make some sense out of that. It's saying, although other nations were influenced by the Greeks to use the matris lectionis, it says, yet the Jews who were particularly averse to holding any communication with pagans cannot be supposed to have adopted this improvement till they were compelled to learn the benefit of it. Now, how were they compelled? It says, by being subjected to the dominion of the Greeks, meaning it was the Greeks that forced the Matris Lectionis on the Jews. We were predominantly against the Matris Lectionis because we already had a writing and language system. But after we were conquered by the Greeks, they forced the vowel letter system on us. It says, But all their extent coins exhibit either Wa or Yod or both of these letters employed as vowel signs. In other words, when you look at the old Israelite coins that have writing on them, the Wa and the Yod are used as vowel letters. And this is why it gets confusing. People say, see, the Matris Lectionis is on the coins. But here's why. It says, and therefore, each must have been stamped subsequently or prior to the period when they came under the yoke of that people. In other words, the reason you can find Israelite coins with the Wa and the Yod used as vowels is because those coins were stamped after we were conquered by the Greeks. Prior to that point, the Wa and the Yod were not used as vowels. They were used as regular consonant letters, Wa and Ya. Now that's very important because a lot of people say that there was no W in ancient Hebrew. But that's not true. It wasn't until the Matris Lectionis that the Wa began to be used as the vowel sound U. Prior to that point, the Wa was pronounced as a W. Let me go back to that quote I read earlier. This is page 5. It says, The Hebrew Bible as it issued from the pens of its inspired authors, was written without vowel signs of any kind, whether points or letters. So again, Moses did not use vowel points or the matrix lectionis. So if that's the case, how do we pronounce the Hebrew words? Well, remember, earlier we read on page 8 in the introduction of this book, that the Greeks introduced new sounds into the original alphabet of the Israelites. So let's start there with the alphabet. This is the Hebrew alphabet. Now in modern Hebrew, this would be Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, so forth and so on. But that is not ancient. In the ancient Hebrew, it would be Ah, Ba, Ga, Da, Ha, so forth and so on. Now again, many people will say, that's not real, that's made up. Okay, but watch this. This is from a website called HebrewForChristians.com. The website address is in the top right-hand corner. This is the actual page, but I added the blue borders just to make it look better. Now, notice that we have the beginning of the alphabet listed. Now I'm going to click on this speaker and let you hear how they say this. Listen. Ah, 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 ba, ba, ga, da, da. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? That's exactly how I said the ancient Hebrew sounds. Ah, ba, ga, da, ha, so forth and so on. Now, I don't want to be misleading. The reason they're pronouncing it this way 
is because they're using vowel points that produce the ah sound. However, this is actually the proper way to say it. This first letter is equivalent to an A, which gives you ah. This letter is a B. You simply add an A to the end of it and you get ba. This letter is a G. You add an A to the end of it and you get ga. This letter is D. You add an A to the end of it and you get da. So all they did was add an A to each character to get the a, ba, ga, da. This is actually the correct way to say the ancient Hebrew alphabet. Look at this. This is an article called Proto-Hebrew had a single vowel. The web address is in the top right hand corner. The word proto means first or original, like prototype. So this article is talking about how proto or original Hebrew had a single vowel. Now they're calling it a vowel. We understand that it's just a sound, but the point is the same. Watch. Let's go down to the third paragraph. Look at the highlighted part. It says, Written languages beyond the Egyptian and West Semitic differentiate vowels even in shorthand writing. In other words, when you read most languages, the vowels are included in the writing. It says, To omit the vowels is odd, meaning it would be strange to write a language and leave the vowels out of the text. It says, Unless... Vocalization was unessential or unambiguous. This is the Oxford English Dictionary. The word unambiguous means something that is not open to more than one interpretation. So let's read it again. It says, To omit the vowels is odd unless vocalization was unessential or unambiguous. In other words, the reason why there are no vowels written in the ancient Hebrew text is because the pronunciation of the words was unambiguous, meaning it was clear. It wasn't open to different interpretations. Ancient Hebrew is a simple language with a simple sound. What does it sound like? Ah, ba, ga, da, ha, wa, so forth, and so on. That's the alphabet. Watch this. It says, Proto-Hebrew was unambiguous. The language had a single vowel, A, which later evolved into other vowels according to syntactical accent. Meaning, later on in history, other vowels evolved from the original sound, A. Ah. However, Hebrew in its original state is a simple sounding language. All you have to do is take the Hebrew consonant, whatever letter it is, and add the letter A to the end of it. That's a simple system that works. That's why vowels didn't need to be written in the text. Watch this. Down here it says, Sanskrit vocalizes each consonant with A without specifically marking that sound. I'm going to show you the Sanskrit language a little later. Let me read it again. It says, Sanskrit vocalizes each consonant with A without specifically marking that sound. Hebrew, likewise, need not mark vowels. The only existing vowel, A, was presumed for every consonant. Look at this. It says, When writing this letter here, which modern Hebrew pronounces as kaf, it says the Hebrews actually meant ka. Now they spelled it with a C. It should have been a K, but the pronunciation is the same, ka. That lines up perfectly with what I said earlier. A, ba, ga, da, ha. And when you get to this letter, it's ka. All you do is add an A to the end of each consonant. So, there is no U sound, there is no O sound, and there is no E sound in the ancient Hebrew. All those sounds came into existence much later 
as the original sound ah evolved into other sounds throughout history. But again, we're dealing with the ancient Hebrew. The original sound was ah. So when you look at the name of the Most High, Y-H-W-H, all you have to do is place the letter A in between those letters and you will get Yahweh. Yahweh. That's the Most High's name in ancient Hebrew. The only other sound in the Hebrew alphabet is the sound I, but I'll get to that later. Now, let me say this clearly. I'm not doing this video for the purpose of attacking anyone because of the name that they call on. That's not what I'm about. I'm well aware that there are many sincere brothers and sisters who may not use the name Yahweh. I'm presenting this information, one, for truth's sake, and also because people have been asking me for years to address this topic with a video. So this is not a personal attack on anybody. This is simply done for edification of the body. Now, let's deal with the Most High's name. Earlier, I said the Most High's name is Yahweh. However, there are many names being used today among Israelites. Two of the more popular names are Yahuwah and Ahia. Those are the names that I get asked about the most. So let's deal with Yahuwah first. Now the name Yahuwah is really close to Yahweh. The only real difference is that Yahuwah has the U sound in it. The problem with that is, as we saw earlier, there is no U sound in ancient Hebrew. The U sound can only be produced through the Masoretic vowel point system or the Matris Lectionis vowel letter system. Neither one of those systems are used in the ancient manuscripts. So let's take a closer look at the name Yahuwah. So on the screen, this is the name of the Most High. It's found in the Bible about 7,000 times. Now, when I look at this name without any vowel points, just the plain letters, I see the ancient name Yahweh. Yahweh. So the question is, how are other Israelites looking at the same name and getting Yahuwah? Well, the problem is this letter right here. This is the Wa. Now remember, I started off in the beginning showing you how vowel points affect the sound of this letter. This letter by itself is Wa. If I put a vowel point on top, it becomes a O. If I put a vowel point on the bottom, it becomes E. But here's the one we want to focus on. If I put a point here in the middle, it becomes U. It takes on the U sound. Now we know that the Masoretic vowel points are not ancient, so we can get rid of this vowel point. Once we take that vowel point away, the only way this can say Yahuwah is if the letter Wa becomes a vowel letter that produces the U sound. In other words, this letter tells the letter before it to pronounce itself with a U sound. So instead of this letter saying Ha, it would keep the H and take on the sound of this vowel letter. And then it would say who. Then this letter ha would have to be a vowel also. And instead of it saying ha, it would say ah. As you can see, I have to use the Matrix Lectionis vowel letter system in order to get the name Yahuwah. Vowel points or vowel letters is the only way you can get that name. Again, remember the quote I read earlier. Let me read it again. It says, I may hereby anticipation add and will be found equally to apply to the matrix lecti onus after it shall have been proved that those letters do not any more than the points constitute part of the Hebrew scriptures as originally written. Also on page five, in the introduction of the same book, it says, The Hebrew Bible, as it issued from the pens of its inspired authors, 
was written without vowel signs of any kind, whether points or letters. So we know that Moses did not use vowel letters. But even if we decide to use the vowel letter system to establish the name, here's the question. Why does this Y character have to be a U? Because according to the Matrix Lectionis vowel system, this letter Y, when used as a vowel, can produce the U sound and the O sound. In fact, it can produce other vowel sounds also, which I'll get to later. But for now, let's just deal with the Y producing the U sound and the O sound. Look at this. This is from a website called BiblicalHebrew.org and the address is in the top right hand corner. This is the Matrix Lectionis rule chart. I want to focus on this section. This is the letter Y. You see it says Y. Now notice above it, it says Biblical, meaning this letter was originally used as a W. But if you look next to it under modern, it says Vav, because now some people use this letter as a V. That's why some people say Va and some people say Wa. Va is modern, but Wa is ancient. There are no Vs in ancient Hebrew. But let's get back to the point. So we're dealing with the Wa as a vowel letter based on the Matrix Lectionis. Let's see what vowel sounds the Wa produces according to this system. Here it says vowel formation. And notice that it produces the O and the U sound. Next to it, under vowel quality, again, we see the O and the U. So if we're going to go by this system, why is it that some people say the Wa always produces the U and never the O? See, this is why you'll find a bunch of websites that say the Most High's name is Yahuwah, and then you'll find a bunch of other websites that say his name is Yahuwah. Some people use the O, some people use the U. This is only happening because of the vowel points and the vowel letters. I say let's get rid of the whole system, the points and the letters, because Moses didn't use either one of them. How about we go back to the first original letter, A, which we know produces the A sound. Again, Yahawah, Yahawah. Look at this. This is an article about the Matrix Lectionis. The address is in the top right hand corner. This is what they put at the bottom of the article. It says, some people believe that saying such and such letter reads as such and such vowel is not quite correct in the case of Matrix Lectionis. In other words, people have found through research that it's not correct to attribute one single sound to each vowel letter. It says, but it would be much more accurate to say such and such letter indicates the presence of certain vowel. In other words, they really don't know what sound these letters are supposed to indicate because scholars have been debating that since they discovered this system. The reason why is because in different writings throughout history, these quote-unquote vowel letters have been used differently. That's why it says this. However, one must not forget the letter Aleph, He, Wa, and Yod used as Matrix Lectionis do not have one specific pronunciation indeed but they rather indicate one of, meaning these letters don't produce the same sound consistently when you look at all the different writings that use them. It says, Aleph can be A, O, E, and even I. It says, He can be A, E, and sometimes O, etc., etc. Now let me show you an example. This is the Isaiah scroll. It's part of the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in the Qumran caves. They date this scroll around 100 BC. Look at this. This is from an article called The Translation of the Isaiah Scroll. 
The address is in the top right hand corner. It says the Essenes in Qumran who copied this scroll approximately 100 BCE are not to be considered the protectors of an accurate text identical with the Tanakh, which would have been revered by the rabbis. They were actually far from the mainstream, and it is clear that the Q text, the Qumran text of Isaiah, watch this, is a dialect of Hebrew. It is not a translation, but is characterized by modifications in spelling and personal pronouns to match the then current Aramaic dialect that the Essenes would have spoken. I got to read that again because a lot of people like to use the Dead Sea Scrolls as a proof of the correct pronunciation of Hebrew. It says, It is clear that the Q text, the Qumran text of Isaiah is a dialect of Hebrew. It is not a translation, but is characterized by modifications in spelling and personal pronouns to match the then current Aramaic dialect that the Essenes would have spoken. Right here it says, Thus, the preservation of an identical letter for letter received text was not at all a part of their motivation and their use of the scriptures. Let's go down to here. It says, With this fact in mind, that the Qumran scribes used their own discretion to alter the text to fit their own dialect. So although the Dead Sea Scrolls was a great discovery, it's still not a reliable source for the ancient pronunciation of Hebrew words. Here's an example of what I mean. Remember earlier I said that the Wa when used as a vowel letter, can produce more than just the U and the O sound? Watch this. This is the same article dealing with the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's focusing on the letter Y and the letter Yod. It says, letter A, Y stands for any vowel. It says, there are vowel additions that are meant to help pronunciation and identification of forms that are peculiar to the Q, the Qumran, scribes. It says, just as the Masoretes invented pointings to indicate vowel sounds, so the Q scribes have added some semi-vowels to the text. The use of Yod, Wa, and He are frequent. Watch this. Right here it says, Wa is used in a very general way. And a biblical Hebrew reader is used to the O and U sound being attributed to the Wa. But the Q scribes, the Qumran scribes, are more general with the use of Wa. And they employ it with great frequency to stand for any vowel sound. From Sheva to Kometz, etc. In other words, the Dead Sea Scrolls uses the Wa to sound like O, U, E, A, and E. Now that is not a reliable system. Let's go down here. It says, letter B, Wa and Yod are interchanged. It says, the Wa and Yod are interchangeable. Where you would expect to find Yod, a Wa will often be written and a Yod where a Wa is expected. This is also frequent in Q or the Qumran text. So again, the Matrix Lectionis is not a reliable system of pronunciation. Any mention of vowel letters in the Most High's name is something that occurred centuries later after Moses. Any development of Hebrew letters being referred to as vowels is something that happened later on in history. Moses did not write the Most High's name with any type of vowels at all. Now, before I move on, I want to say this again. This is not an attack on anyone who uses the name Yahuwah. 
This video is just for edification. Now, let's deal with the name Ahiah. Finally, we're going to go into the scriptures. We're going to see if the Most High's name is Ahiah or Yahweh. The name Ahiah is used by a lot of Israelites, and the basis of using that name is found in Exodus 3 and 14, where it says, Ahiah, Ashar, Ahiah. In the Hebrew, that's I am that I am. That's Exodus 3 and 14. But let's start at Exodus 3 and 13 to get the context of what's happening. Here it is. It says, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers have sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Now, I'm going to say something that you may have never heard before. Moses is not asking the Most High what his name is. He already knew the Most High's name, and I'm going to show you that. When you go up to verse 6, the Most High tells Moses who he is. He says, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That statement alone clarified exactly who he was. Moses knew who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was. He knew his name already. Back in verse 13, when Moses says, And they shall say to me, What is his name? This is talking about something more specific than a literal name. See, this is why sometimes you have to go into the Hebrew because the English doesn't always bring out the clarity of what is being said. Moses was asking the Most High to give some type of proof that he could bring back to the children of Israel so that they would know that it really was the God of their fathers. Moses knew it was him because he was having the experience right then, but he knew the children of Israel would not believe him. Watch, let's read it again. It says, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers have sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Now, on the surface, it sounds like Moses is asking for a literal name. But notice what Moses said. He said, I'm going to tell them you are the God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's an identifying title. The children of Israel knew who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was. The problem was they had been in captivity so long crying out to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob without receiving any response. They lost hope. They felt like the Most High wasn't with them anymore. That's why Moses said, When I tell them the God of your fathers have sent me unto you, they shall say to me, What is his name? Now this is where the Hebrew becomes very important. The word name in Hebrew is Shem, and it does mean a literal name. That's true. But that's the most common meaning, but it has a much deeper meaning beyond just a literal name. Look at this. This is Shem from the Vine's Concise Dictionary of the Bible. It says, Shem, 8034, name, which we know. But then it says, reputation. Stop. Because now we see that sometimes the word name is not talking about the name itself, but instead the reputation behind the name. So what is a reputation? A reputation is a way of doing things that people know you by. When a person is known for doing things a certain way, that style of doing things becomes the reputation of that person. For example, Today, we can say the Most High has a reputation of defending the children of Israel. Why? 
because he's known for doing that. So the word name can also mean the reputation of a person. Let's go down to this part. It says, Shem can be a synonym for reputation or fame, which is the same thing. You become famous for something you did. You make a name for yourself, not a literal name, but a reputation. Right here it says, if a name goes forth for one, his reputation of fame is made known. So as you can see, the word Shem or name goes beyond a literal name. When you see the word name in the scriptures, you have to understand the context of the verse in order to know if it's talking about a literal name or the reputation or fame of that person. Moses is not asking for a literal name in Exodus 3 and 13. He wanted to know how to respond to the children of Israel when they started asking him to prove that the Most High sent him. That's why Moses said, they shall say unto me what is his name. Not his literal name, but the character of who he is. In other words, they were going to say, okay, Moses, if the Most High really sent you, describe him to us. What was he like? What did he say? That's what Moses was worried about. He wanted the Most High to give him a description that would convince the children of Israel that he was telling the truth. That's why the Most High said this, verse 14, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Meaning, there are no words that fully describe me. You can't explain me. I just am. That's why he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am have sent me unto you. Now in the Hebrew, I am is translated as Ahiah, Ashar, Ahiah. Yes, but that's not his name. He's just saying, you can't describe me with words. I am that I am. I'm beyond explanation. He's telling Moses that there are no combination of words that fully explain who he is. He just is. He exists. So verse 14 is dealing with trying to describe the Most High. You can't stop at this verse because the conversation is not over. The next verse is where he actually gives Moses his name. Watch this. Verse 15. And God said moreover unto Moses. Now what does moreover mean? It means he continued to talk to Moses and then he said this. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel. Meaning... What I'm about to say to you now is what I want you to say to the children of Israel. It says, the Lord God of your fathers. Stop. Let's look at this in the Hebrew. Here it is. Notice where the word Lord is in the English. The Hebrew says, Yahweh. It doesn't say Ahiah. It says, Yahweh. Yahweh, God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob have sent me unto you. Now, he clearly just said that his name was Yahweh. Let's see what he said next. It says, this is my name forever. What name is he talking about? Yahweh. He didn't say that about Ahiah. He said, Yahweh, this is my name forever. It says, and this is my memorial unto all generations. What does the word memorial mean? It means remembrance, meaning we are supposed to remember that name throughout all our generations. Yahweh, the God or power of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's go to the next verse. Watch this. This is the Most High. He's still talking to Moses. Verse 16, it says, Go and gather the elders of Israel together, 
and say unto them. Now let's see what he tells Moses to tell the elders of Israel. It says, the Lord God of your fathers. Stop. Once again, let's look at this in the Hebrew. Notice where it says Lord in English. The Hebrew says Yahweh. That's two times back to back that the Most High said his name was Yahweh. It says Yahweh, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. Now notice, he told Moses to say, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. Why did he say that? Because as I said earlier, they had been in captivity so long that they thought the Most High forgot about them. He told Moses to reassure them that he sees their condition and that he's about to deliver them. Now watch this. I'm going to prove to you that it was never about Moses or the Israelites not knowing the name. It was about the children of Israel doubting that Yahweh, the God of their fathers, was still with them. After the Most High told Moses what to say to the children of Israel, watch how Moses responds. Exodus 4 and 1. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. Watch this. For they will say, The Lord have not appeared unto thee. What is the word Lord in the Hebrew? It's Yahweh. So Moses said, they're going to say, Yahweh didn't appear unto you. Meaning what? They knew the name. They just wasn't going to believe that he sent Moses. Why? Because they had been in captivity, praying for deliverance all that time, and it hadn't come. They had given up. And then all of a sudden, Moses was going to pop out of the blue talking about Yahweh sent me. Moses said, they're not going to believe me. That's what was happening. It wasn't about them not knowing a name. Moses was concerned that when he told them that it was Yahweh that sent him, they was going to be like, man, get out of here. Yahweh ain't sent you. Listen, the name of the Most High was known way before Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Watch this. Genesis 4 and 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, said she, have appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. So we're dealing with the time of Adam and Eve. Now watch this. Verse 26, it says, And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Look at this. It says, Then begin men to call upon the name of the Lord. What does that word Lord say in the Hebrew? It says, Yahweh. Every time you see the word Lord in all capital letters, that word in Hebrew is Yahweh. So men have been calling on the name of Yahweh since the time of Adam and Eve. That's not a new name that popped up in the book of Exodus. The children of Israel knew that name, and so did Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew the name of Yahweh. Now, me saying that brings up a problem that we have to address before we move on. Exodus 6 and 3. I still have to deal with the name Ahiah, but I want to make this point first because this is important. Exodus 6 and 3. Let's read it. It says, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. So it says, The Most High appeared unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. 
Now, when you look up this word Jehovah in the Hebrew, it says Yahweh. So people say, see, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they didn't know the name Yahweh. That's not what it's saying. The word name in this verse is Shem. And I already showed you that the meaning of the word name goes beyond just a literal name, depending on the context of the verse. Now, before I explain what that statement means, let me show you first that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did know the name Yahweh. Let's start with Abraham. Genesis 12 and 7. It says, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. Verse 8. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord. Now watch this. It says, And called upon the name of the Lord. What is that word Lord in the Hebrew? Yahweh. In the English it says, And called upon the name of the Lord. The Hebrew says, Yahweh. Basham Yahweh. It tells you right there that Abraham called upon the name of Yahweh. In fact, the Most High told Abraham what his name was. Watch this. Genesis 15 and 2. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? Let's go down to verse 7. And he said unto him, this is the most high talking. I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees. Again, what does that say in Hebrew? It says, Why ya Amar, Al Yawa, Anya, Yahweh. I am Yahweh. So there is no way that anyone can honestly say that Abraham didn't know the Most High's name. The Most High told Abraham his name was Yahweh. Let's see if Isaac knew the Most High's name. Genesis 26 and 17. It says, And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. So this is Isaac. Let's go down to verse 24. It says, and the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. Verse 25. And he built an altar there, watch this, and called upon the name of the Lord. There it is. Once again. What is that word Lord in the Hebrew? Yahweh. The Hebrew says, Yahweh Basham Yahweh. Isaac called upon the name of Yahweh. He knew the name. Now let's see if Jacob knew the name Yahweh. Genesis 28 and 10. It says, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So this is Jacob. Let's go down to verse 12. It says, And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Verse 13. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, watch this, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father. The Most High said, I am Yahweh, the God of Abraham, thy father. It says, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed. Let's go down to verse 16. It says, and Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. What did Jacob just call the most high? Yahweh. 
In the Hebrew, he said, Akan Yashahawa Bamakwam Haza Wa Anakya La Yadaifya. Surely Yahweh is in this place, and I knew it not. So we clearly see, and we know for sure now, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew the name Yahweh. The Most High told them that was his name. So what that means is we have to go back to Exodus 6 and 3 and get the proper understanding. Let's read it again. It says, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. Again, Jehovah in the Hebrew is Yahweh. Here it says that the Most High did not make himself known to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by the name Yahweh. But we already read that they knew that name. So what does this mean? It's saying that they didn't know the glory of his name through a personal experience. And I'm going to show you that's what it's saying right now. See, this is why we cannot afford to be lazy. We have to look words up, especially when the words are translated from a different language. This verse is a perfect example. It says, But by my name, Yahweh, was I not known to them. What does the word known mean in this verse? Let's look it up. Here it is. It's number 3045. It's the Hebrew word, Yadai, and it means to know. Letter A says to know, learn to know. B says to perceive. C says to perceive and see, find out and discern. D says to discriminate, distinguish. Now, look at this. E says to know by experience. This is what Exodus 6 and 3 is talking about, and I'm going to show you that. What experience is the Most High talking about that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob didn't have with him? He's talking about the destruction of Egypt and the deliverance of the children of Israel. Watch this. Ezekiel 20 and verse 9. It says, But I wrought for my name's sake that it should not be polluted before the heathen among whom they wore. So the Most High said, I wrought, or I did the work that I did for my name's sake, so that my name would not be polluted. Watch this. In whose sight I made myself known unto them. How? In bringing them forth out of the land of Egypt. That's not talking about a literal name. That's talking about an experience. The Most High made his name known to the children of Israel through the experience of delivering them out of Egypt. That's what Exodus 6 and 3 is talking about. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they knew the literal name Yahweh. We read that. But they didn't get to experience the glory of his name like the children of Israel did. They didn't see the Most High destroy Egypt. They didn't see the ten plagues that he brought. They didn't see the Red Sea split in two. They didn't see the nation of Israel walk into the land of Canaan, destroy their enemies, and inherit the promised land. That's what Exodus 6 and 3 is talking about. Not his literal name. They knew his literal name, but they didn't know the glory of his name that would come from that experience. Again, the word name in that verse is Shem, 8034. Look at this. Letter A says name. But notice what letter B says. It says reputation, fame, glory. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob didn't know or experience the fame and glory of the name Yahweh like the children of Israel did. I hope y'all could see that. When the Most High destroyed Egypt, his reputation, fame, and glory spread all over the world. Look at this. 
Joshua 9 and 8. And they said unto Joshua, We are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, Who are ye? And from whence come ye? Verse 9. And they said unto him, From a very far country thy servants are come. Why? Because of the name of the Lord thy God. Is this talking only about his literal name? No. It says, For we have heard the fame of him in all that he did in Egypt. See that? After the Most High destroyed Egypt, his fame and glory went throughout the whole earth. That's what Exodus 6 and 3 is talking about. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob didn't get to experience that. They knew his literal name, but not the fame and the glory that would later be attached to his name. They didn't have that experience. So now that we understand that, let's go further into explaining the name. Now, as I said earlier, the name Yahweh is in the Bible about 7,000 times. And no, it wasn't inserted into the text to trick you. That's a lie. And it's not some type of evil name that makes you call on Satan. That's a ridiculous lie. Yahweh is the Most High's name. And if somebody tells you that the word Yahweh is evil, then ask that person how to say Judah in the ancient Hebrew that we speak. Because Judah in the ancient Hebrew is Yahweh duh. Let me show you. Genesis 29 and 35. And she conceived again and bare a son. And she said, Now will I praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah and left bearing. Let's look at this verse in the Hebrew. Here it is. I'm going to read it in parts. The English says, now will I praise the Lord. The Hebrew says, Hapa'im awadah Yahweh. The second part says, Therefore she called his name Judah. The Hebrew says, Alkan kwara'a shamwa Yahawadah. That's Judah, Yahawadah. Notice, that the word Lord highlighted in yellow is Yahweh, And the word Judah highlighted in yellow is Yahweh Da. That's Judah. Yahweh Da. Now the name Yahweh Da is a combination of two Hebrew words. The first word is Yahweh, which is the Most High's name. And the second word is Yada, which means praise. When you take the word Yahweh and add the da from the end of the word Yada, you end up with Yahweh da. Praise Yahweh. That's why Leah said, Now will I praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. So Judah is Yahweh da. And Yahweh da means praise Yahweh. So let's think about this. If the Most High's name is Ahia, wouldn't praise the Lord be Ahia da? Yeah, but that's not what it is. It's Yahweh da. Also, the tribe of Judah is not Mata Ahia da. It's Mata Yahweh da. Now, if the word Yahweh is an evil word or the name of Satan, why is it part of the name Judah? Hebrews 7 and 14 says, For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. So you're telling me that the Most High brought the Savior of Israel into the world through a tribe named after Satan. Really? Stop it. That makes no sense. Let's go to Isaiah 42 and 8. It says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. It says, I am Yahweh, that is my name, not Ahia, Yahweh. It's right there. 
Now, let's take a closer look at the name Yahweh. This is from the website ancienthebrew.org. The address is on the top right hand corner. Now, this website doesn't actually deal with the ancient Hebrew, but I want you to see what they say about the Most High's name. This is unbelievable. Right here it says YHWH. So this is dealing with the Most High's name. It says, Virtually all translations from Judaism and Christianity use the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, for the Hebrew name of God, Y-H-W-H. Now watch this. It says, The original pronunciation of the name can never be determined with complete accuracy. But in Hebraic thought, it is the meaning of a name that is more important than its pronunciation. Now this is ridiculous. Notice that he said the original pronunciation can never be determined with complete accuracy, right? But watch what he says next. It says, the Hebrew YHWH is the verb Hawa, meaning to exist, with the prefix Y meaning he. Therefore, the word YHWH means he exists. Okay, so how do you say he exists in Hebrew? Yahweh. Yah means he, Hawa means exists. Yahweh, he exists. That's why I said this is unbelievable. How can you say the name can't be determined with complete accuracy when we know how to say it? Yah is he, Hawa is exists. Yahweh, he exists. That's the Most High's name. Look at this. This is from a book called The Legacy of Adam and Eve. This is chapter 5, Hawa the Creator. It says, A highly prominent name is that of Hawa. Look at this. It was the most ancient name for the Creator. You see that? It says, it was the most ancient name for the creator. Right, because the word Hawa means exists. Now, when you put Yah in front of Hawa, you get he exists. Yah Hawa. Right here it says, as time flowed on and the world fell apart, different people developed different names for the Father God. For the creator, king of gods, and for other superhuman personalities, which is going into false gods also, because even their names get changed over the course of time. But we're dealing with the true and living power, Yahweh. So although different names have popped up throughout history, the most ancient name for the Most High is Hawa. The prefix Yah goes in front because when we speak of him, we say he exists. Yahweh. That is his name. Now let me make a disclaimer of my own. I do not endorse every single thing written in this book or any book except for the Bible. The Bible is the foundation. I'm only using these books and these sites as references to make certain points about this topic. I just want to make that clear, okay? All right, back to the topic. Now, a lot of times, when I tell people that the original Hebrew alphabet is Abagadaha, so forth and so on, they laugh and they say, brother, that's not real. No language don't sound like that. Okay, let me show you something. This is a language called Sanskrit, and these are the consonants of that language. Now, I'm going to let the guy say it for you. I'm not going to play them all because they all sound the same. But listen to this. Ka, ga, da, pa, ba, sa, ha. So here's another old language based off the ah sound. And if you're an Israelite, you know that all languages come from the original language Hebrew. So it's not a big stretch to believe that the original Hebrew alphabet was indeed Abagadaha, etc., etc. 
Now, as I said earlier, the only exception to this rule is the sound I. So let me run through the full ancient Hebrew alphabet. A, ba, ga, da, ha, wa, za, ka, ta, ya, ka, la, ma, na, sa, I, pa, taza, kwa, ra, sha, tha. Now the consonant or letter that I want to focus on is the I. This is the only letter that sounds different from the others. An example of the letter I would be the word Shammai, which means hear or listen. Deuteronomy 6 and 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, which in the ancient Hebrew would be Shammai, Yasha Allah, Yahweh, Allah Hayanawa, Yahweh, Akkad. Now, I want to make this quick point because I hear people say this a lot. I'm not holding on to this dialect of Hebrew because I can't read the modern Hebrew. I can read the modern Hebrew the same way I'm reading this one. I study both of them. However, I choose to speak this dialect of Hebrew because I believe that it is the ancient Hebrew. I just want to make that clear. Now, let's go back to the letter I. So you have the word Shammai, which means hear or listen. Also, you have the word Yadai, which means to know. And there's many other words with the I sound in it. Now, there's a controversy about how this letter really sounds. But again, if you take away the vowel points and the vowel letters, the original sound this letter makes is I. Even today in modern Hebrew, this letter is called Ayin. You can clearly hear the I sound at the beginning of the word, Ayin. That's significant because of this. All Hebrew letters started out as symbols. They're called pictographs. Before this letter looked like this, it started out like this. This is the picture of an I. This is the origin of the Hebrew letter Ayin. Now, let's look up the word Ayin and see what it means. Here it is. And it means I. I of physical I. So the word Ayin means I. That's clear. The letter itself started out as the picture of an I. And even still today, the word Ayin means I. All the evidence suggests that this letter makes the I sound. So, that brings me to the last name that we have to cover. The name of the only begotten Son of the Most High, whose name is Yahawashai. Now, I already dealt with the vowel points and the vowel letters that create these other sounds. So, any other name for the Son that has those sounds in it, like Yehoshua or Yahushua, I'm not going to deal with because I already showed you that there are no O sounds or U sounds or E sounds in the ancient Hebrew. So the only two names in question are Yahawashai, as I believe, or Yeshaya, as some others believe. So let's see what the son's name is. Now, there's a lot of people who say that the Messiah's name is Yeshaya. But let's look at the evidence and see if that's true. Now remember, the people who say that his name is Yeshaya, they use the same Hebrew dialect that I use. So this should be easy to clear up. Watch this. Let's look up the word Isaiah and see what it says. Here it is. This is Isaiah in the Hebrew. Let me take these vowel points away. Now, what does this say? Yah, Shai, Yah, Yashaya. This is Isaiah's name. Watch this. Even if I put the vowel points back, I'll let the guy on the website say his name. Listen. Yashaya. Yashaya. Did you hear what he said? He said Yashaya. That's Isaiah's name. So here's the question. Did the Messiah have the same name as Isaiah? 
No, he didn't. So his name could not have been Yeshaya. It doesn't matter if you spell it with an I or an A. The pronunciation is still Yeshaya. That was Isaiah's name. Now we know that the Messiah did not have the same name as Isaiah. But guess what? He did have the same name as Joshua. Let's prove it. This is Acts 7 and 44. It says, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. So this is talking about Moses and the children of Israel in the wilderness with the tabernacle. Verse 45, it says, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. So here it says, our fathers that came after Moses brought the tabernacle into Canaan with Jesus. Now we know this is not talking about the Messiah because he wasn't physically there. So why does it say Jesus? Because it's talking about Joshua. Joshua and Jesus is the same name. Jesus is just a Greek transliteration of the Hebrew name Joshua. Joshua was the leader after Moses passed on. He carried the tabernacle into the land of Canaan. The translators put Jesus in this verse because Jesus is the Greek transliteration of Joshua. Look at this. This is the Easton's Bible Dictionary. The address is in the top right hand corner. This is Joshua. It says, Joshua, Jehovah, which we know is Yahweh. So it says, Yahweh is his help or Yahweh the Savior. In other words, Yahweh is salvation. That's what Joshua means. It says, the son of Nun, of the tribe of Ephraim, the successor of Moses as the leader of Israel. Meaning, he took over after Moses passed on. Watch this. It says, he is called Jehoshua in Numbers 13 and 16. Watch this. And Jesus in Acts 7 and 45 and Hebrews 4 and 8. So we see that Joshua is called Jesus in Acts 7 and 45. Why? Because it's the same name. Jesus is the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew name Joshua. Now we know that the Messiah was not Greek. He was a Hebrew Israelite. So if he had the same name as Joshua, let's see how to say Joshua in ancient Hebrew, Numbers 13 and 16, it says, These are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land, and Moses called Oshea, the son of Nun, Jehoshua. Who is Oshea? That was Joshua's original name. Watch. Let's look it up. Here it is. It's number 1954, and in the Hebrew it says, Ha wa shai. Ha wa shai. Now, what does ha wa shai mean? Down here it says Hosea or Hosea or Oshea, which is ha wa shai in the Hebrew. It means salvation. Letter A says family name of Joshua, the son of Nun. So we see that Joshua's original name was ha wa shai, which means salvation. But remember, the verse says Moses called Oshea, the son of Nun, Jehoshua, meaning he changed his name from Hawashai to something else. Notice, I have Oshea and Jehoshua highlighted. We know Oshea is Hawashai. Let's see what he changed his name to. This is the same verse in Hebrew below it. I have the first name highlighted. It says Hawashai. What did he change his name to? It says Yahawashai. All Moses did was add a Yah 
which is he, to the front of Hawashai. So he changed his name from Hawashai, salvation, to Yahawashai, he is salvation, meaning Yahweh is salvation. That is the name of the only begotten son, Yahawashai. He had the same name as Joshua. Now let me say this again one last time. This is not an attack on the brothers and sisters who use the name Ahiah and Yeshia. I know that there are sincere brothers and sisters who call on those names. This video is for edification and truth's sake. And to be fair, I understand why people use the name Yeshia. Brothers have shown me the process that they use to get that name. They go into the concordance to number 3467, which is the Hebrew word Yeshai, which means to save. Then they go to number 3050, which is the Hebrew word Yah, which is the short form of the Most High's name. So they take the Yeshai and combine it with Yah, and they get Yeshai Yah. That's cool. But that doesn't work because when you do that, you still end up with Isaiah's name. Yeshia is Isaiah, no matter how you get there. We know that the son of the Most High did not have the same name as Isaiah. So that doesn't work. But scripture and documentation proves that he did have the same name as Joshua. We know that Joshua's name in the Hebrew was Yahweh Shai. Therefore, we can correctly say that the Messiah's name was Yahawashai because they had the same name. Now, somebody might be saying, why would the Messiah have the same name as Joshua? That's a good question. And here's the answer. Because Joshua in the wilderness was a precursor or foreshadow of the promised Savior. This is why Yahawashai said in Hebrews 10 and 7, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Meaning, everything written in the Old Testament was a foreshadow of what he would do when he came. For example, in the wilderness, Joshua brought the children of Israel into the promised land. But eventually, we got put out. At the return of Yahweh Shai, he's going to bring us into the promised land. But this time, we won't get put out. Also, in Zechariah 3 and 8, you see Joshua the high priest. We know the high priest offered sacrifices for the sins of the people. That was his position. But this Joshua was flawed as a man. He had his own sins. But now, Yahweh Shai is our high priest. He knew no sin and offered himself for the sins of our nation, Israel. Yasha Allah in the Hebrew. All the former Joshua's were types of saviors, but the promised savior who actually fulfilled the will of the Most High is the only begotten son, Yahweh Shai. That is his name. So the Most High's name is Yahweh and the son's name is is Yahweh Shai. Now, since this video is dealing with Hebrew, I'm going to say this. Waya Batakwa, Baka, Yawadaya, Shamka, Kaya La'a, Azabda, Darashaka, Yahweh, which being translated is Psalms 9 and 10. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Yahweh, has not forsaken them that seek thee. Now that verse leads me to the last part of this video. Many brothers have said to me not to worry about the names of the Father and the Son because in the kingdom of heaven, the Father and the Son are going to have new names that nobody knows. Now the verse that they gave me for that point was Revelations 3 and 12. So let's read it and see if that's what it's actually saying. And I'm going to read it just like it's written. It says, Him that overcometh, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven 
from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Now, this verse doesn't say anything about the Most High having a new name. It just says, I will write upon him the name of my God. But I can understand why somebody might say that the son will have a new name because it says, I will write upon him my new name. So I can understand that. However, we know that we have to get understanding through precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. This verse is not saying that Yahweh Shai is going to have a brand new name in the kingdom of heaven. Even though it says new name, through the precepts, we can see that this is not talking about a new personal name. But before we find out what this verse is actually talking about, I want to show you something because Yahweh Shai only has one true name. Watch this. Revelations 19 and 11. It says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. So we know that this is a future prophecy of the return of Yahweh Shai. John said, he was called faithful and true. Now, faithful and true, is that a name or is that a title? It's a title. Watch this. Let's keep going. Verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Now here it says that Yahweh Shai had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Is this talking about a name or a title? We're going to find out. Verse 13, it says, And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Again, it says his name was called the Word of God. Is that a name or a title? It's a title. It's not a personal name. It's a title that he possesses. Watch this. Let's go down to verse 16. It says, And he have on his vesture and on his thigh a name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. Once again, King of kings and Lord of lords. Is that a name or a title? It's a title. So we see the context of these verses show us that these names are actually titles, not personal names. So the name in verse 12 that no man knows it's not a personal name. It's a title that the Most High gave Yahweh Shai that nobody knows yet. He only has one true name. See, what I wanted you to see is that the term name does not always mean a personal name. Now, let's go back to Revelations 3 and 12 and get the understanding of what that verse is actually saying. Here it is. It says, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. Now, notice it says, him that overcometh, meaning this is going to happen at the end, once we overcome the wickedness of this world. What is he going to do? It says, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. Now, keep in mind, this is after we overcome the wicked world. What is Yahweh Shai going to do? It says, and I will write upon him my new name. 
What is this talking about? What is this new name that he's going to write upon us? Remember, one of his titles from Revelations 19 and 13 is the word of God. Revelations 3 and 12 says that when we overcome this world, he's going to write upon us his new name. What is this new name and how is he going to write it upon us? The new name is the word of God. And he's going to write it upon us by writing it in our hearts. Now, you might be saying that's the same name. Yes. But why is it considered a new name? Because in this context, it's talking about the actual word of the Most High. And he's going to write it upon our hearts under the new covenant. In other words, it's the same name, the word of God, which is the law, statutes and commandments. But it's going to be written newly in our hearts under the new covenant. Here it is. Hebrews 8 and 8. It says, For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Verse 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continue not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. See, the Most High gave us the word of God, the law, the statutes, and the commandments. He gave us that under the old covenant, but we broke that covenant. So what is he going to do? Verse 10, it says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. Watch this. This is what Revelations 3 and 12 is talking about when it says, I will write upon him my new name. It says, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. See that? He's going to write his laws in our hearts. That's the new name. The word of God, which is the law, written in our hearts under the new covenant. That's what makes it a new name because it's a new covenant. It says, and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. So we see that Revelations 3 and 12 is not talking about a new personal name. So when you hear people say, Yahweh Shai has many names, that's not true. He has many titles, Prince of Peace, Faithful and True, even the Word of God. But he only has one personal name. Matthew 1 and 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, which in the ancient Hebrew is Yahweh Shai. That's his name. The angel told Mary to call his name Yahweh Shai. Why was he given that name? It says, for he shall save his people from their sins. So his name is and will always be Yahweh Shai. Now, even though the angel told Mary to name him Yahweh Shai, when you go down to verse 23, it says, and they meaning the people, shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, have you ever seen a verse in the Bible where anybody ever called him Emmanuel? No, because that's not what it's saying. What does Emmanuel mean? It says, Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. In other words, people would see Yahweh Shai, and the great things that he did, and they would say, Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. But he was not called by that name. He has a name, and everybody knew it. They called him Yahweh Shai, which means Yahweh's salvation. Now, before I go, 
I'm going to say one more thing in the ancient Hebrew for the brothers and sisters out there who do appreciate the language. A lot of you who know the ancient Hebrew are familiar with this passage. This is the blessing that the priest would pray over the children of Israel. Number 6, 24 through 26. But let's start at verse 22 to get the context. Number 6 and 22, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them. So, this is the blessing that the Most High told the priests to say over the Israelites. I'm going to say each line in English first and then the Hebrew after. Verse 24, it says, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. Yabaraka Yahawa Waya Shamarka. Verse 25, The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. Yaar Yahawa Panyawa Al Yaka Waya Verse 26, The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Yasha Yahawa Panyawa so that's the priestly prayer. Now, let me say it all together once in the Hebrew. Here it is. Yabaraka Yahawa, Waya Shamarka, Yaar Yahawa, Panyawa Al Yaka, Waya Kanka, Yasha Yahawa, Panyawa Al Yaka, Waya Shamlaka, Shalawam. Notice what the next verse says. Verse 27, And they, the priests, shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. What does that mean? How did the priests put the name of the Most High on the children of Israel? In other words, when the priests prayed this prayer over the Israelites, they were marking the Israelites as the Most High's people. For example, if you live in a house with a bunch of people and you buy something that you don't want to share, you put your name on it to show that it belongs to you. It's your possession. Well, through the prayer of the priest, the Most High put his name on us to show that we are his possession. So name in this verse is not talking about his literal name. It's talking about the seal of the Most High that he places on his people. Once again, this is why the definition of words and context is important. Now I'm going to stop here because this video could go on and on and on. It's so much to say on this topic, but I think the point is made. But let me say this last thing. If after watching this, you feel like it's pointless because we're going to learn a new Hebrew language in the kingdom, then watch my video called Zephaniah 3 and 9, Hebrew Now or Later. That video shows you that Zephaniah 3 and 9 is not talking about the Hebrew language. So in conclusion, the Most High's name is Yahweh and the Son's name is Yahweh Shai. I hope somebody got some understanding from this video. And with that, I say Shalom.